When my husband Bill and I first started attending Centenary, there was a lady that used to sit behind us at church. I'm going to call her Sylvia today, and she was one of our unhoused populations that often lived on a bench up near College Street. Now, Sylvia had a tambourine, and Sylvia would oftentimes tie her dog outside of the church and come inside with her tambourine. Now, I had to tell y'all, Sylvia never once ever rang her tambourine at a time in the service when it was appropriate to play the tambourine. Um, so I remember one Sunday, Sylvia came in. She sat right behind Bill and I. Preacher's praying, and Sylvia stands up, and she's shaking that tambourine. And I thought to myself, if Sylvia shakes the tambourine one more time, I'm going to turn around and punch her in the throat. At that very moment, the pastor said, who are you excluding from the kingdom of God? <clears throat> and it hit me in the stomach. And I knew at that moment, I did not believe that Sylvia deserved to be in that church. <clears throat> that pivotal moment in my life and in my story led me to go back and start thinking about why would I ever believe that Sylvia didn't belong in that church when I knew for a fact that there were many times in my life where I was the one on the fringes. Six years old, sissy. My father took us on a trip to the mountains to ride horses. We're riding along, we're having a great time, me and my brother, my uncles, the whole extended family. We're riding these trails. It's one of those moments that could be a memory for me in my childhood that was positive. It could have been a fun memory. But instead, the memory evokes the word sissy. Because on that trip, my dad decides to tell the whole group riding that Scott is the poster child for better birth control. He's nothing but a sissy. Twelve years old. Faggot. Middle school was hard. Middle school is hard for a lot of people. But when you go and you hear this word over and over and over again, you wonder to yourself, like, is that me? No. My answer was always, I'm not gay. I'm not gay. I'm not gay. I said it so much, I often believed it myself. That same little kid began going to the altar at church every Sunday and praying this prayer. He would pray for at least the next, like, 30 years. God, please, please remove my homosexuality from me. Please take the storm from my side. Please don't make me be gay. Please, please, please. That was my begging prayer to God for many, many, many years. Let's fast forward to 18. I wanted to fit in so bad. All I ever wanted was to be, like, on the other side. I didn't want to be on the fringes. I just wanted to fit in. I found fitting in very easy in nightclubs where drugs and alcohol were prevalent, and I quickly, quickly became a drug addict. By the time I was 24, I had a needle in my arm. By the time I was 26, I was living under a bridge. By the time I was 28, I was in prison. <clears throat> the next part of my story kind of changes. You know, I've been on the fringes. I've seen how the fringes work. Um, I found prison to be a place where I could make a difference. I found prison to be a place where I could lead people, where that some of the things that I had found in life to be um, difficult, I found prison to be pretty darn easy. I had been, <laughs> been to college. Um, I had an education I knew how to like read and write, and I was like, wow, maybe I can use this to my advantage. I started teaching uh, other guys in prison how to get their GED. I started teaching math. I started teaching writing. I helped them write letters to their parents and their family. Um, it became kind of like a pretty easy ride for me for that time I was there. I started NA and AA groups in prison to try to help other guys get the kind of knowledge that I had about what it could be like on the other side. And then it got me thinking, on the other side, fringe, on the other side. Like, looking back at it, I can see pivotal moments that really shaped all that. When you're going through it, a lot of times you're so engulfed in it that you don't even know that that's what's happening. Yeah. So when I got out of prison, 
funny story. Um, they, sent, they sent me home with a, leg, with a leg monitor. It was like this big um, on the side of my leg. Guess, guess what you can't get when you have something that big on the side of your leg? A job. Um, <laughs> so uh, every single interview I went to, the, whoever was interviewing me did nothing but look at my leg the whole time um, I would interview. Even when I was doing right, I still felt like I was on the fringes. I felt like I just couldn't get ahead. Um, I wound up getting a job. I took the, the, the least, oh, I'm trying to think of a word, word here, the least desirable job I could think of that I wanted. I had applied for every job from a counselor. I want to do all these things. And instead, I became a line cook at McDonald's. And I flipped hamburgers, and I flipped hamburgers, and I flipped hamburgers. And within a year, I had my own store as a store manager. And then from there, I became a regional operator. Um, and I had stores all over middle Georgia, which led me to Macon. When I got to Macon, my office was right up the road um, on Pionona and Vineville. And little did I know that my husband, Bill, lived right behind my office. Um, lucky for me, that became another pivotal moment in my life because I found someone that I could build a life with. Now I'm looking at fringe dwelling in a different way. I'm looking at, like, how can I help people? I'm starting to look at different ways that I can be of service to people because I've had people in my life that are pouring into me. So Bill and I start going to Centenary, and we met Sylvia, of course, from the beginning of the story. But one thing that quickly people started to notice is Scott still goes down to the altar every Sunday to pray some stupid prayer. Um, I would go down, pray that prayer, um, even after I had met my now husband, and I prayed this prayer, God, please take my homosexuality away from me. Please, that's my prayer. And one Sunday um, after church, pastor came up to me and said, Scott, what do you go down there and pray for every Sunday? What is it that you keep going down and asking God at the altar? And I told them, and they grabbed my shoulders, and they said, you never have to pray that prayer again. You're a beloved child of God, perfect just the way that you are. When I look back at the fringe dwelling that I'm doing now, I see these pivotal moments, that being one, that really changed the trajectory of my life so that I could do the work that I do now. Because of that moment, I started seeing other people that had similar journeys to mine. I started seeing LGBT kids in our community that probably needed a mentor that might have had a dad that called him a sissy, maybe middle schoolers that might be in school right now being called a faggot. I saw other people that were on the fringes. I saw homeless people like Sylvia that literally started coming into my, my realm of consciousness. I saw them coming and I saw them coming and it just kept growing and kept growing and kept growing. And I kept growing, and I kept wanting other people to be in my realm. I wanted to see who else can I help? Who else can I invite in to my inner circle? Who else can I see that maybe I haven't seen before, that maybe I didn't want to see before? Something hit me again just this past week like a ton of bricks. I was out canvassing for this election we just had. And um, I went with one of my really good friends. We got our list, got in the car, we drove over. I want y'all to think about this. Everybody in this room, no matter where you live, no matter where you're from, you have roads and streets that you use as cut-throughs. You cut through. You, get, you use this one to get to the grocery store. You might use this one to get the kids to school. You might use this one to go to Dairy Queen. You know, all these little streets that you just cut through, right? We cut through. But how often... Do you take a left down Madden Street and maybe just see there's 12 houses down, down there where Miss Mary lives or Mr. Larry lives? What happens if you take a right down Cole and you meet Miss Alice? Like what happens if you start taking those roads that aren't just your cut through anymore? Guess what happens? Those people become your neighbors. All these people that used to be on the fringes they're now part of your community, like, right? But it gets even deeper than that. Do you know why? Because every place that we went and canvassed was a neighborhood in my own town that even a week ago, I probably would have called dangerous. 
Do you know why it's dangerous? And this hit me hard because I never thought about it till then. Because black people live there. That's the only reason that people would consider it dangerous. And it's not dangerous. Um, I never one time felt uncomfortable. I walked straight up to a trap house. I'm here for voting. I'm, I'm here for voting. Just voting. Just voting. Uh, and I mean, it, it wasn't dangerous. I looked down my friend list on social media and I'm thinking like, how many people on here would also feel that way? It's not. And we have to change the dialogue. You know, just because somebody's different of you. I've really had this like thing, like I thought I was dwelling on the fringes. That's a cute little name, yada, yada, yada. And then the more I worked on this talk, the more I realized that even in that saying that, I'm othering people. Yeah. You know, like even in that where in my head it was good. In doing this talk, I've learned so much because even in the title of my talk, I was othering people. I was centering myself over here and everyone else is over there. And I've learned so much. In my meditation practice, I do this thing a lot. And it's one of my absolute favorite things. And the day after the election, I met with a group of people in the meditation room at Bohemian Den. And we did this meditation. And it never felt more powerful in that moment than, than, than that moment. Um, and I'm going to let y'all do it with me today because I think it's a very, very, very powerful thing for us to gain as a collective whole people here in this space. I want you to take your hands. You can close your eyes if you want, but I want you to take your hands and cup them. And I want you to place your hands over your heart. And I want you to feel your heartbeat beating in your body. And once you feel it, I want you to really, truly connect with your heartbeat. And when you have done that, I want you to start visualizing that heartbeat rippling out from you. It touches first the person beside you. It keeps on rippling and rippling and rippling and rippling. It's like a stone cast into a pond. It just keeps rippling out from you. That beautiful, beautiful, amazing rainbow prism light shining from your heart. It is touching each and every person you encounter every single moment of your life. Picture it. It's like light through a stained glass window cast onto the ground. The beautiful light shining out from you touches every single person you encounter. Your heartbeat, your life force, the light that is within you, bring those fringes in Invite them in so that we can all become one. Thank y'all.